Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Monday of the sixth week of Epiphany. Thank you for being with me this morning. Um, our lessons today are, we're going to start Isaiah chapter 63. And for the New Testament, we're going to go backwards a little bit and and begin the book of First Timothy. And our psalm is number 135. Uh, but before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us as we come into your presence from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. All right. Now... Let's get into our psalm. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Number 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds, clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people Israel. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. So those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, 
you are great and have done mighty deeds. You have shattered the powers of darkness and have shown compassion to your servants. Keep us from being deceived by idols, for there is no God like you. Your renown endures from age to age. Blessed be the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. All right, our first reading is from Isaiah 63. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. The Lord's Day of Vengeance. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. And I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so, so this this section um, <laughs> takes a little bit of a turn from what we've been reading, right? So up until now, in chapter sixty one and sixty two, talking about um, talking about God coming back and redeeming His people, right? But this is a different image here. You kind of have. Uh, it's almost like a like a guard standing at the gate. Hey, who goes there? Who is that? It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save, right? Single person. And we have marching, but it's one person. So why is your why are your clothes red, your garments? Like somebody who's been in the wine press. Well, the wine press is not something that um that's not really a solo uh something you do by yourself. Usually um, there would be the stomping of the grapes would be a big party. The family, the whole family would do it. The community would do it. I have trodden the wine press alone and from the peoples, no one was with me. I trod them in my anger. I splattered, trampled them in my wrath. Okay. This is not really grape juice. Is it? This is blood. This is a, um, it's a metaphor for, um, it said, no, this isn't, I haven't been in a wine press. I've been, I've been stomping people, right? He has laid waste to people in his wrath. Their blood is spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. The day of vengeance was in my heart. He came to save his people. You know, if this is God speaking, which it must be because he did it by himself. No one was with me. I was alone. He did it by himself. The day of vengeance is in my heart. My year of redemption had come. Right? He is redeeming his people, which many had to deliver them from their oppressors, from their conquerors. I looked, but there was no one up to help. I was appalled. There was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation. Hmm. Doesn't even say it's God, but it is the person who brings salvation to God's people, right? The warrior from Edom, my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk on my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. This is the bringer of God's wrath to save his people. Very much like um, Revelation, isn't it? This is an apocalyptic text. So, um that's all we're reading today 
but we will pick up with verse seven tomorrow and get to see more clearly what's going. All right. So we go from wrath to mercy and that's what tomorrow will be. And that's, that's the key to reading these, these things in the old Testament, right? Look for God's mercy and grace. It's always there. You just have to make sure you're looking for it. Don't take things out of context. What was happening here? He's saving his people from those who had conquered them, right? Yeah, this is this is his wrath, and it, it's going to be brutal, right? Okay. Now let's go back to Timothy. We're going to read verses one through seventeen. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different kind, any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, and slavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal and visible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So typical Paul greeting, right? Here's who I am. This is my name. I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle of Christ, Messiah, this Jesus of Nazareth. Not because I sought it out, Paul says, but by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope. God did this to Paul. God made him this. All right, so that's who's writing the letter. Who's he sending it to? He's sending it to Timothy, his child in the faith, not his biological child. But he, he is, Paul looks at him as his, his child, his son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God and Christ. Well, he adds mercy this time. Usually it's grace and peace. All right. He's telling Timothy he has to stay at Ephesus to stand against the false teachers. There are some people who are heretical, right? They are teaching something other than what Paul taught, right? Stick with the church at Ephesus to keep them devoted to Christ and the true gospel. Don't devote yourselves to myths, things that aren't true. Endless genealogies, well, you know, we have to trace our lineage back to Abraham or, you know, these are typically the, 
what they what Paul calls Judaizers, um, people who insist you have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. This was specifically Paul's message. It's not about who your biological father is. It's about who your heavenly father is. It's about who your brother is who died to make sure we would be adopted into the heavenly family. These genealogies and myths promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith, or this word could also mean the good order that is by faith. Faith is the key here that unlocks salvation, not genealogies, not these other false teachings. The aim of our charge, Paul and the apostles, is love that issues from a pure heart. Okay? You want to bet that's agape? Let's see what it says. Verse 5. The aim of our charge is love. There it is. Agape. Love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. This is the kind of love that Paul is trying to um, nurture in the churches that he, that he uh, starts. Certain persons, these false teachers, by swerving from love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, they have wandered away into vain discussion. The things they're talking about have no relevance to the gospel. They desire to be teachers of the law without either understanding what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. They make it sound like they are author authorities on this topic, and they don't get it themselves. We know that the law is good, right? It's from God. Of course it's good. If it is used lawfully in accordance with God's will. Understanding that the law is good if it's used lawfully, the law is not laid down for those who are just. It is laid down for the lawless and disobedient, ungodly sinners, right? This is the law pointing out to people their sin. This is this is how this is how this works. The law shows you your sin. This is the second use of the law. Convicts you, makes you realize you need a savior. But even before that, the law serves as a guide. It is the, the first use of the law is called the curb. Keeps you on a path so that you can live in harmony with your neighbor, right? That's what it's there for. It's there for people who don't know what it is or to show them that they need to this is how life is to be lived. Well, who are these lawless and disobedient? Who are the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and, and the profane? Unholy and profane, this people who specifically act against God, don't worship God, sin. What do those sins look like? Not only dishonor their parents, but strike them. Murder, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality and slavers, right? Liars, perjurers, right? This false witness. Whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which Paul has been entrusted, okay? The sound doctrine follows that gospel, okay? These are examples of uh, of sins, lawlessness, and disobedience. These are examples of it, but this is not an inclusive list. Whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Right? That's the law is to make these people realize their sin. Okay? So, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, Paul says. He judged me to be faithful and appointed me to his service. 
This is where Paul's authority comes from. Okay. Paul didn't seek this out. Why? He was actively working against Christ and his gospel and his message. He was one of these people who teach, who taught the law. He was, he, Paul was a blasphemer. Now, how could he be a blasphemer? Because he denied the son of God, right? Persecutor. He had Christians arrested and sent them to be executed. He was an insolent opponent. He opposed the work of Christ and his apostles. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. God knew that Paul's ignorance, his unbelief, was because he just didn't know. So Jesus revealed himself to Paul. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love in Christ. Christ can love anybody, even those who are killing his followers. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. That's quite a statement. Christ didn't come into the world to save the righteous and the holy. If you're righteous and holy, do you need to be saved? No, he came to save sinners. Paul was the worst sinner. Sorry. Paul received mercy for this reason, that in Paul, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. If Jesus can take his most fervent opponent, his most insolent opponent, the one who was the most zealous to prevent the gospel from spreading, if Jesus can take him and make him one of his best evangelists, that is going to serve the kingdom of Jesus Christ very well. Wait, was it this guy came to believe in Jesus? This guy is spreading the gospel? Maybe we need to listen. Because Paul will say later, <clears throat> you think you're a Jew? I'm a better Jew. I'm a Pharisee. I know the law. <laughs> He's equipped to have this discussion with very educated Jews. And he realizes that all that was for naught. He was a sinner. All right, we'll pick up there tomorrow. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the loving plan of your wisdom took flesh in Jesus Christ and changed mankind's history by his command of perfect love. May our fulfillment of his command reflect your wisdom and bring your salvation to the ends of the earth. We ask this through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. O Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Monday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, Vespers tomorrow night, and we'll stay on track the rest of the week. So uh, I hope you have a blessed Monday. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.